Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, welcome. It's great to see all of these faces on a cloudy Monday morning. And I don't know what it says that everybody's ready to talk about racial battle fatigue on Monday morning, but uh, that's a good thing. So um, I wanna just uh, rem remind you again, welcome you all again. This is uh, the third in this colloquium series that we've been doing on race, equity, and justice. And I'm Bonnie Thornton Dill, Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities and professor in the department, in the Harriet Tubman Department of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. Um, this series is part of R. Hughes' broad campaign on race equity and social justice, which is addressing structural racism and creating strategies to ensure equity and social justice throughout the college, campus, and community. The campaign's initiatives include transforming curriculum and scholarship, reducing discrimination in teaching, research, and service, and expanding the impact of our college's work which has been long time and continuing on racism, anti-racism, equity and justice through the community and other partnerships. Consistent with President Pine's call to focus on race and identity as we welcome new members of our community, we are pleased to have students participating with us this morning as part of the new Terrapin Strong onboarding program. In our view, part of our approach is to offer opportunities for you students to be exposed to the many different ways faculty and scholars in the college study and teach about these issues. So as part of this series, I've been inviting faculty experts from across the college to discuss their scholarship and creative projects relating to anti-racism and social justice. And like our first two, the format will include a mini presentation by our speaker, followed by conversation with me and then an opportunity for you to ask questions. We will be keeping your microphones muted for the talk. And then during the last about 20 minutes, you will be invited to submit questions through the chat, which is being moderate, moderated by Associate Dean Linda Aldori, uh, who will read and the questions. So please note also that the event is being recorded for future viewing on our Hughes website. So today I'm really pleased to have an opportunity to welcome and chat with Scott Reese. Uh, Scott is an Emmy award-winning professor and, and the head of the theater performance group in our School of Theater, Dance and Performance Studies. Professor Reese is a nationally renowned theater director with credits spanning both the stage and television. His recent performances include the premieres of Colossal, Embrace, Etudes for the Sleep of Others, and Blues Journey at the Kennedy Center, and The Waiter and Black Ballin at Arena Stage. So without further ado, let me present Scott Reese. Thank you, Scott. Oh, thank you, Dean Dell. It's so good to be here. Thank you for inviting me for this very important discussion in the series. And uh, looking at all the people, I couldn't ask for a better cross section of people. I have neighbors, I have students, I have friends across the campus, friends across campus I haven't seen for a while. Uh, obviously, this has gotten out to a lot of people. So it's um, as theater practitioners, we miss the stage, we miss being in groups of people, talking to people, and this is the next best thing. So thank you for everybody that, you're right, of, maybe it's because <laughs> it's such an ugly fall morning after we had so many nice fall uh, weeks before this. So, hey, nothing else better to do, come and listen to Scott talk, I'll take it. Oh, I think you're muted, Bonnie. Yeah, right. There. So it's all yours. You can kind of begin where you want to. And at whatever point you want me to start asking questions, I'll be happy to do that. Great. OK, so I thought I would first start out with a little bit about the definition of racial battle fatigue and how I came to it. Uh, I didn't know that there was a term racial battle fatigue until I was way into it. And I'm going to give you the definition of it first. So racial battle fatigue 
uh, RBF was a term coined in 2008 by critical race theorist William Smith. It was originally used in reference to the experience of African American men in America, but it's now expanded to describe the negative and racially charged experience of all people of color in the United States. William Smith defines RBF as cumulative result of a natural race related stress response to distressing mental and emotional conditions. These conditions emerge from constantly facing racially dismissive, demeaning, insensitive, and or hostile racial environments in individuals. People of color experience daily battles of attempting to deflect racism, stereotypes, and discriminations in predominantly white spaces, PWIs, and must always be on guard or weary of the next attack they may face. Both the anticipation and experience of racial trauma contribute to racial battle fatigue. And uh, I'll put this uh, up on our chat. Uh, there's a uh, website that you can take a look at it. But it goes on to say that Racial battle fatigue causes people of color to suffer various forms of mental, emotional, and physical strain, which can lead to psychophysiological symptoms. The symptoms of RBF are suppressed immunity and increased sickness, tension headaches, trembling and jumpiness, chronic pain and healed injuries, elevated blood pressure, pounding heartbeat. When people of color with RBF anticipate racially motivated conflicts, they may experience rapid breathing, upset stomach, or frequent diarrhea urination. Other possible symptoms are constant anxiety, ulcers, increased swearing and complaining, insomnia, stress, anxiety, dreams, rapid mood swings, difficulty thinking or speaking coherently, emotional, social withdrawal in response to racial microaggressions, or while environments of mundane racial stressors. These stressors can lead to long-term health issues caused by people of color to lose confidence in themselves and their worth. I know that's a lot, but I wanted to take a little time to read that because, uh, I probably suffer from all of these. We cover it very well, but in the COVID situation and we're right now, we're seeing why people of color, especially so many time black and brown people, the incidence is so much higher because we have these predisposed conditions that are already going on. I don't think I took it as seriously until we did have the coronavirus scare. And now every time that you do have frequent urination or you're not sleeping well, you're tracing it back to all the things that are cumulatively happening. And then you have to make yourself even safer in this environment. So you aren't going to infect yourself or infect others. So how did I come to discovering RBF, uh, racial battle fatigue? Uh, I'm one of those like many of my colleagues here at University of Maryland, a first one and you suffer from that first one series. When I went to, uh, I started out at Eastern Illinois University for my undergraduate and it's a this very small state college in Southern Illinois. I was putting myself through college so I had to find out what was the cheapest college that I could get to that I could pay my way through and that was Eastern Illinois University. Uh, fortunately for me, it happened to have a wonderful theater department. Uh, I was the only black student in the theater department. And when I was a freshman, there was a young lady named Joan Allen, just happened to be a senior, and a young uh, gentleman named John Malkovich, who had just graduated. All of the people I was surrounded with in my first couple of years there just happened to go on and create the Steppenwolf Theater Company. I didn't know that at that time. I just thought that everybody was that good of an actor. So I just really had to try hard. Uh, when you're in that group of people, you're not seeing your color, so you almost repress that. So you're fitting in with the dominant culture, which is probably not a good thing. After my first two years, fortunately I had a roommate that said, hey, if you really wanna do theater, you should probably go into either Los Angeles or New York, and uh, you're gonna have to move there at some point if you're really serious about this. I was a music major, and I was dabbling more in theater, but theater had become my love. Once you get on stage, I got the bug like everyone else and you wanted to do it. So I ended up thinking Los Angeles, New York, ah, no more snow, let's go to Los Angeles. So fortunately, uh, UCLA had one of the top four music departments in the country. So I knew I'd be getting a good education. I transfer out there and I starting to do more theater and auditioning for the shows, taking some of the classes and I'm seeing a little bit more of a mix of students, but once again, I'm one of two black students in the theater department of all of UCLA, and I have three Asian uh, American friends, and I still remember their names, Alan Maroka, uh, 
Jason Ma and Liz Kubota. You think that 30 years ago, why can I still remember their names? Because it was such a small group of people. And fortunately, they all went on to be successful. I did okay for myself. I then realized through this, none of my education is spotlighting anything about black musicians, black theater practitioners, that I'm learning all of the white canon, but it isn't until I get out of school that I start understanding there's a whole other black canon that's out there. Fortunately, I had a wonderful uh, acting, uh, professional acting teacher, Gerald Hickman, and he sat me down and said, hey, along with all the white canon that you're doing, here are some other plays and playwrights that you should be thinking of also. And he was a white man, but he was taking care of me and realizing this is what we have to do to increase your structure. I then worked in LA for a while. And once again, I'm working, wanted to do more stage, but it ends up being, there isn't that many roles for young black men at that time. And I gravitate towards where I can get the jobs and that's TV and sitcoms. And in each sitcom, there'd be one young black boyfriend part. In the soaps, there'd be one black storyline that would go on. And so you have pretty much a segregated society inside this. And once again, I'm very lucky. I was one of the lucky ones that got picked to be able to do this work. I was able to do it. But then you're thinking of at what cost as you're always trying to fit into the dominant group. So fast forward, I realized what I'd rather like to do is more stage. So I moved to New York to get out of the TV and film business. I'm in New York for maybe six to eight months and things are going okay-ish until I'm auditioning for, and remember this was a long time ago, things were different at this time. Uh, they were calling me back for the uh, boyfriend on the Cosby show. And Sabrina Buff had been, the first year they said she had asked for something, they weren't gonna bring her on the show. So they didn't have her the second year they were bringing her back. Now we kind of understand what might've happened. And I'm uh, called back for the young boyfriend of Sabrina LaBeouf. While I'm auditioning for that, they say there's another show that's happening in Boston. It's called Ready to Go. And it's a morning talk show. And they was time of MTV and every city had their own morning talk shows. So they said, go down the hall talk. And all of a sudden there's a man, Bob Glover, who was a black man who was the producer for the show. In all my years yet, I've never had a black producer, a black director, not a person black that was in charge of what I was doing. I auditioned, I auditioned, I really didn't want the job. I just moved to New York. I'd only been there six to eight months. And they thought this was, I was a negotiating ploy, I guess. So they offered me more money and pretty soon it would be silly to say no. A friend of mine who was a Broadway actress who had just nominated for Tony, Liz Calloway was up for the job too. We talked to each other and said, this is a three-year contract in Boston. Will you do it? And she goes, I'll do it if you do it. And we um, had a wonderful contract. It's called Favored Nations. So we both had the same thing. Move up to Boston and all of a sudden I have, am surrounded by, since it's a black producer, there's black videographers, there's black segment producers on the show. It's a very mixed uh, group of people along with black. Uh, another program that they had before was Zoom, which was very multiracial. So I'm now in this group of people, which I've never seen before, people in the arts that is reflecting what my world looks like. Since I had that three-year contract, all of a sudden I said, if there was anything that I could do after I had this three-year contract, because nobody in theater has three-year contracts, you're lucky if you have work on the show for a year at a time. So I said, you know what I really miss since I'd done it all the time growing up in high school and college was teaching and directing. So a friend said, well, why don't you just go back to school, get a degree in uh, teaching or in directing, and then that you do that with your career. So fortunately, I went to Northwestern and they, uh, I think it was, it was probably one of the whitest universities for a theater in the country, even though it was one of the best. But fortunately, Craig Kinzer, my mentor, they had just stopped doing a two-year MFA and they were going to a three-year MFA. And Craig really wanted to diversify Northwestern and especially the performance program and directing. So he brought me in. I had three wonderful years where I helped change the department. I had a wonderful mentor, Sandra Richards, who was probably one of the top scholars 
in black theater and uh, theater from the diaspora. All of her classes I took. Uh, my first year there that Lloyd Richards, who was the original director of Raising the Sun and was the director of the August Wilson plays, was doing the original production of Two Trains Running at the Goodman Theater. They needed an assistant for him. And since I was the only black person in the MFA program, and this is all the designers along with the directing program. Out of 14 students, I was the only black person in the program. So of course it fell to me. I went to Sandra, said, Sandra, I'm just new here and how am I gonna carry my work and assisting Lloyd? And she goes, Scott, there's nothing that you can learn in these classrooms that you're not gonna learn from Lloyd Richards. Lloyd happened to be at that time, the head of Yale School of Drama. And he was also head of the O'Neill Writer Center in Connecticut. And don't you know that I did have the most almost post-grad experience from Lloyd Richards. Uh, and I'd be remiss to say also, I was then introduced by a good friend, Anthony Chisholm, who played Wolf in the production. And Anthony went on to do most of the August Wilson plays. And he just died this last week at 77 years old from COVID. So we'll talk about that with racial battle fatigue also of losing your mentors, your friends, uh, black artists who've gone before you because of everything that's going on. So I'm at Northwestern every year, I'm working at the Goodman with Marion McClinton uh, and the best black directors that they were bringing to the Goodman, that became my second home. You start feeling you're energized there, but everything else around the buildings when the structural racism that's going on Lloyd would never eat lunch or dinner in the building. I said, why don't you eat here? And he said, well, the only reason that they bring me in here is to do the black shows. And this is a man with so many Tony Awards, ran Yale School of Drama and the O'Neill Center. And to think that a Lloyd Richards was ghettoized in a way that the only thing they would ask him to do is a black play. So he goes, I'll do my work here, but I don't have to eat here. So we go a soul on seventh downtown and every dinner and break, he would just give me the world history of black theater. So even though we have to make place for ourselves, we can expand our space amongst each other. And it put that thought in me, wow, the labor and the cost and the exhaustion for him every day to walk in that building, to do his job, leave that job there and walk out again. Fortunately, when I was doing a show with him too, I met Shirley Jo Finney. This will come back later. Shirley Jo Finney is one of the most well-renowned black women directors in the country. And three years ago, we brought her in to do uh, Citizen here at University of Maryland. One day, Shirley Jo was in the lobby and the white artistic directors and the people in power at the Goodman were talking to her about the way she should be directing this black play even though it was written by Regina Taylor, a black woman, the white men in power were telling Shirley Joe how to do this. Lloyd goes, he saw the corner of his eye. He goes, Scott, we need to go across the hall. We go out and Lloyd physically had her back. Now there's two more black men that are there talking. The dynamics of the room switch all of a sudden. Regina, feel, I mean, Shirley Joe feels that she can have her voice, she can say something. And without Lloyd saying a single word, you realize that she had the power by people behind her. Once again, what is the fatigue of having to fight these battles each time? So then I uh, graduate, uh, University of Maryland had not had a black professor in the theater department for four years. Uh, before I came here, there was a wonderful scholar, Harry Elam. Uh, Harry Elam left for a leave of absence and went to Stanford and never came back. <laughs> uh, and it's funny that uh, after he became the head of the department, then the Dean of Fine Arts at Stanford. And now this year he became the first black president at Occidental College. So in the fall, he started as the presidency of, of Occidental College. So, uh, they did a search, they brought me here, and I was the only black professor in the theater department. We had two undergraduate students and two graduate students. 
I was brought here to jumpstart the black theater programs to increase the enrollment of the students. And it's really tough when there is no one in the department. So it was beating the boards, trying to find out dancers, musicians, anyone that wants to do theater. Uh, first, we started out doing coffee uh, houses and we did play reading, I'm sorry, we did uh, poetry readings and uh, poetry slams. Pretty soon we got a group of people. I was able to do my first play, which is called Day of Absence. After that, that brought more people to the department. I started a group called Voices of Color, which was uh, for just black students in the beginning. But after a couple of years, some of the other students of color said, hey, we'd like to have a place to play also. Can we be in your group? And we said we were being just as racist as the other groups if we weren't able to allow anyone in our group. So we changed it to creativity and it was a multicultural theater group and anybody that was interested in multiracial issues could be part of the group and this year we celebrated our 25th year we started out with about eight kids in the group and now we have over 25 students in the group uh, so for myself as i'd been doing this and creating and bringing i started realizing when i started going to conferences all of the black theater practitioners were talking about being burned out and they're just about to retire. And these are people in their forties and fifties with tenured positions. I wasn't hearing the same from my white colleagues. My white colleagues, they would retire at 70, 80 years old. That wasn't happening. I didn't know any older black colleagues in academia that were going on. So I started doing some research and that's when I wanted to do a conference for black theater network on battle, uh, on the racial battles that we always have to fight. I'm doing a little research and all of a sudden I find out, oh, there's something not just called racial battle, but racial battle fatigue. And I go, oh, we're always fighting these racial battles, but because of this, we're getting fatigued by it. And what are we doing? So I gather my information. I did my first uh, workshop with them there. And that was pretty successful and everyone wanted to find out more about that. So then I started uh, the Black Theater and Dance Symposium about six years ago here at University of Maryland where we first did it every year and now we're doing it every other year. And in the third one of that we did, the whole conference was based around racial battle fatigue. And along with my colleague, Alvin Mays, he helped me design this along with Thembi Duncan. And we were saying, this is an epidemic and we have to figure out how we do this. Fast forward now to Black Lives Matter and after George Floyd's killing that we've had two groups now that concentrate on racial battle fatigue. We see white theater and also black theater united. So I think of where I started being the only one in so many situations, how that was starting to weigh on me and all my colleagues. And now we are today, it's a national movement. That was a long answer. That was a good answer, thank you. You know, one of the things that um, strikes me as you talk about this is, and as you describe it, is um, the embodied nature of it. In other words, I think a lot of times when people think about racial battle fatigue, they think of exhaustion, they think of, you know, kind of just being tired and burned out. Burn out, that's the word that you use. Yep. But you also, in this definition, identified um, a lot of embodied outcomes, blood, um, blood pressure, uh, heart racing, uh, stomach, uh, you know, a, a number of, of things like that. And I wonder if people are beginning, I, I was fascinated that, by that for two reasons. Yesterday, just yesterday, and not related to this at all, um, I heard about, someone was talking about racism and how it is physically embedded within all of us. Mm -hmm. um, and this, they, they told me about a book called My Grandmother's Hand, Hands, Racialized Trauma. You know this book. Yeah, I know, by Resma, exactly. In fact, we want to bring him to the Clarice because he's an artist also to do workshops for us. Okay, so talk a little, I mean, that's what, that's what resonated for me. I'll put the book in the chat if people are interested in it, but 
the, the embodied nature of this and its long-term um, its long-term impact and the ways in which kind of aggressions, but also microaggressions contribute to that. I wondered if you'd talk a little bit. About yeah, and I'll go back to, once again, since I didn't invent this, I just am one of the people that suffer from it. And I'm glad that you said microaggressions because we're doing a lot of work now here in academia and our wonderful chair, Lee Wilson Smiley, had done a couple of workshops on racism in departments because here in theater and dance, we have to work so much with each other. And most of the plays that we do have so sociological and political reasons for why they're written. Uh, so once again, we did uh, uh, Claudia Ra uh, Rankine's Citizen three years ago, which was a whole play from uh, the adaptation of a book, which was all about microaggressions. Mm -hmm. And since after uh, Lieutenant Collins was killed, we said, what is the reaction that we can take to this? So once again, we are doing that work. We know what microaggressions are, but with uh, Professor Smith, he says, first of all, you have the psychological stress responses, examples, frustration, defensiveness, apathy, irritability, sudden changes in mood, shock, anger, disappointment, resentment, it can keep going on. That's the, then you have your behavioral stress responses, which, and I love this, it's a stereotype threat, John Henryism, or prolonged high effort coping with difficult psychological stressors, increased commitment to spirituality, uh, overeating or loss of appetite, impatience, quickness to argue, procrastination, increased use of alcohol or drugs, increased smoking, withdrawal from isolation from others, neglect of responsibilities, on and on. But a lot of us do suffer from that John Henryism where we have to do twice as much for half the credit. There's a wonderful book called Presumed Incompetence, which uh, I think Psyche might be out there. I think she might have turned me on to the book. Uh, but basically assuming that black scholars are lesser and even some of our scholarship isn't as widely known because so many times we're the forefront of this scholarship. So the scholarship isn't reviewed in the same way. So we do twice as much for half the credit. The same thing goes into theater that there are so few jobs out there for people of color. So you, it, then it goes into Cornell West, the best black syndrome. Mm -hmm. So you're not just competing uh, well, it was the same way in academia. In presumed incompetence, they say, there might be 10 black scholars to go up for the job. The best person might be from uh, Illinois State University. They're not gonna look at him because they'll look at the lesser candidates from the Ivy Leagues and Big Tens, so they know that they can get the best black. So why should they even look down in the pile? So it's that stressor. And then they say the psychological stress responses, we already said that headaches, grinding teeth, clenched jaws, chest pain, shortened breast pounding. It makes you fatigue just talking about what <laughs> this embodied work happens for you. And we had to talk about in theater uh, of having, and this was, uh, bef this was years before I was doing Raisin in the Sun out at Olney and I had the wonderful actress Rebecca Rice who had done every black woman part of stature over 20 years. She started with August, August Wilson works and she had worked at all the theaters. Raising the Sun was gonna be her last performance because the thought of her putting on eight times a week, the put upon black woman who uplifts her family had really taken a toll on her. And I'm not sure if that, but then three years later, Rebecca died of cancer. And she wasn't diagnosed at that point but what's the correlation of a woman who had been putting this on? Uh, the other part of this is women in theater, so many parts, they're the one, if someone is hit on stage or taken abuse on stage, it's usually woman at the hands of a man because so many times that's what's happening in life. So if you think a cumulative effect of that also, as a black woman that's dealing with that trauma, we have to take a look. And I also have to say, for myself, oh my gosh, how many times have I been part of that also as a director? Because 
theater's built on tension and conflict. And if that's what we're looking at, so many plays are written that way. So you really have to make sure that you're juggling of what are we asking our actors to do, and especially what are we asking our students to do. So you talked a lot about um, kind of identity mm -hmm. in terms of, um, I, I was struck by the fact that you said it wasn't until you kind of got out of college that you began to learn a, that there even was a black canon or, a, you know, yeah. um, and that you learned nothing about that in college. Um, and, and also you're this, soul black person. So there's a whole lot about identity kind of embedded in what you're talking about. Right, and I right. wondered if you would say a little bit about um, how you see kind of the, re the relationship between something like racial battle fatigue and the construction of identity or how that influences the way in which identity might be constructed. Identity is one of the issues that students are talking about in Terrapin Strong. And so you could really make this kind of um, a, a teachable moment. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, cause I, and I had to look up, you know, Terrapin Strong again, uh, and thank you Dr. Pines for creating this, but the program that's included a brief history of our institution, unconscious bias and anti-racism training, diversity, equity and inclusion training, sexual harassment training, and an introduction to our cherished traditions. I think that's so important because by having this program, students can identify this before it debilitates them. So for myself, it goes to code switching. And there's a great book on code switching called Code Switch. Uh, so for myself, if I was walking in a predominantly white environment that I had to code switch so it's almost that double consciousness of Du Bois that I have to know all of the white canon, plus I know my black canon and the LGBTQ canon and sometimes other canons. It's not incumbent on a white professor to know all of those. I think we're doing much better now, but my, identi my identity as a gay black man and even biracial gay black man puts me into a place where I have to center myself when usually I'm in places with centering whiteness. So once I realized there was this canon, that was one of the first things that I did here at University of Maryland, I started two courses in black theater performance. And it's the history of black theater and performance and where most schools would do one semester so with gun and canoe, you go from late 19th century to the, 19, uh, to the present. But fortunately with some of my colleagues here and uh, Professor Hildy was great in uh, having my back on this. Let's make two classes. We're gonna do late 19th century to the 1960s, then the 1960s to the present. And so then we made this also a core class and you got history theory of the arts, distributive studies, so, so many students can come and take this. So originally it was for our students, but it came so popular that it's filled by many more students from outside the department, our department. And it's one of the few times when, if there's 25 students in the class, probably 20 students will be students of color and usually predominantly black. And then the other five students will not be that. So I'll ask students, why are you taking this class? And they said, well, it fits into my schedule. And then every semester, I want to take one class that I don't feel like I'm the minority in the class. And after they've taken all their AASP, African American Studies Programs classes, what else can they take? And sometimes they become our majors. But once again, in the department and in, in TDPS, there is a place for Black students to know our history is valued. And not just one course, but two courses. So every semester, there's something that's speaking to me. And it's also with programming that there's not a year goes by that we're not either doing a black play or a multicultural play. And I always try to do every other year with a black play because you don't want the black students to be tokened into, well, you're just doing that play. No, you have the choice of doing that play or you don't even have to be in the black play. There's other students that can do that. You can be doing the Shakespeare, or you can be doing the other play too. So I think to answer your question, 
we know our identities. We have a place for you that identifies in this way. And by doing that, you're honored and you don't have to be fatigued because there's places where, and it's, it's interesting when I teach the class, I don't have to code switch as much. And now I usually have a graduate student that will assist me and then they'll teach the class. And it's interesting to see when a graduate student of color that teaches the class, how they're able to use more of their colloquialisms and their vocabulary because they're talking to students that understand where they're coming from and they don't have to explain it or um, be afraid of it. So one of the takeaways I'm hearing from you is that because of course, once you lay this out, people wanna say, well, how do you survive this? How do you, how do you keep from, um, uh, and, and, and how do you protect yourself? And so, and I'm, one of the things I'm hearing you say is part of that comes out of being in a place where your identity is acknowledged, recognized and valued. Mm -hmm. Yes. At least that's one of the, the sustaining things for you. Are there other things that sustain you? Yes, and that's why it's important. So many people, well, now with the Black Lives Matter movement, we need to have more black history class. I go, no, we need more black faculty. Yes, you should change your syllabi. You should have been changing your syllabi. Most people have been doing that. But for me, that's just putting lipstick on a pig. I know we're in a high and freeze right now, but when you have a significant faculty of color, all of a sudden it's attracting more students to your departments. And the same thing as uh, Dean Dill has this, and with Dr. Pines would have uh, happy hours for the black faculty that we started years ago. And just to know there's so many other people out there that you're not going through this alone. And like me, one of the OGs, uh, one of the older people, uh, <laughs> for people who don't know the phrase, uh, we mentor. And the amount of people that I've met through our happy hours that I now have relationships, and it's not just them needing me, I'm fed by them. They have that energy, that young energy that I came in with, that the world's my oyster, I can do that. And so if we're always connecting, we're helping each other in the same way with the students. So many times I still might be one or two people of color in a faculty meeting and a committee meeting, but I go into my musical theater class or my directing class and I have half uh, the class are students of color. I don't feel less than in that also. Linda, that's great. Linda, do you have questions or shall I invite questions at this point? Yes, please uh, go ahead. Thank you. We have, um, we have one question, but please go ahead and open it up and then I'll ask the one question we have at this point. Great. Okay, all right. So yes, so let me invite you to put your questions in the chat. I'm sure there's, uh, there's a lot to think about. Uh, Scott, mm -hmm. I guess I have two questions just as we're getting started. One has to do with, one is very specific to theater and casting and how you deal with these issues in that because I think the theater department has a particular approach to that. And then the other um, thing that, that is um, related to that is kind of, you've talked about these things in relationship to theater, but you've also implied some broader kinds of issues and topics for other departments and fields and for us as a university at this time. So those are kind of the two things. They're, they're not exactly related, but two things I'd be interested in hearing you say a little more about. So I'm sorry, but the and I wasn't hearing a question. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, you didn't. <laughs> First, I asked you about casting, about yeah. and and the relationship of racial battle fatigue. I mean, you're in theater to casting and how people are cast. You know, who right. plays what roles. Got it. That Got was it. the first question. Okay. So I'll stop. Yeah. It. Uh, it's interesting that right now I'm working with the DC Theater Summit which is an organization through the Helen Hayes and League of Washington Theaters to deal with uh, anti-racist and anti-oppressive theater. It's really kind of hit its apex right now in DC. Things have been bubbling for a while, but once again, with George Floyd and the movement, and I think everybody knows, We See White Theater, which was a letter that was written to 
all the theaters in the country and the Broadway theater say, we have to change these practices. So with the DC Theater Summit right now, we're approaching all of it in, of how black artists, and, I'm, and I'll only, and this is so many times, these are other people of color, but I can only speak as a black artist right now, that black artists are paid less than white artists doing the same role. Women artists are paid less than male artists doing the same roles in DC theater. And since it's not an agent driven, you know people's salaries, it's only when you talk to someone and a friend that you find out how much they're actually making. And it is, everyone started saying, let's all share our salaries. It was just horrendous what you found out about that. So realizing how colorism happens in DC, Maryland, Virginia theater, and then harassment that's going on. And I'd had students before that would tell me, is this what really should happen at this theater? I say, no. And if there's no one to take care of it, sometimes I'd have to step in or I would call, we have a union called Equity, Actors Equity Association. You would contact them and try to get remediation for this. But once again, these are closed doors, there's theaters, we're all putting on plays, but once again, they're businesses and how do we make them equitable? So that's how casting and equity, the, the latest things that we're working on for that. Wow. We do have a couple questions now. Um, one of them is, um, so how do you reconcile trying to set a space dedicated for us as minorities without being exclusive as our non-minority counterparts have? Space to process is necessary, but it can create an emotional tug to try and create that space while not going to the other extreme. Yes, and that's why having the language, having done the work, doing so many workshops from me between Black Theater Network, American Theater Higher Education. We have a Black Theater group from that. We do workshops. Uh, we're and now so many people are doing it just because it's happened recently. But I've always wanted to make sure that I'm here for all of the cast or all of the students. So you're not making, you're not othering anyone. And I think for us, every rehearsal starts with a circle and we call it uh, the sacred circle where you speak about anything that you need to speak to before you start the rehearsal. There's also uh, room rules. So in this rehearsal, we will do no harm. Instead of calling it a safe space now, I call it a brave space because you have to be brave to do this kind of work in the space. And if something happens, we'll address it right away. So for myself, I have room rules for each of the rehearsals that I go into, and sometimes some of the meetings also. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, another question, you talk about how theater thrives on tension as if it's built in. So how do you navigate the misogyny and racism and homophobia then that are actually baked into the form? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, that's about play selection. So once again, First, do no harm. And there's certain plays that if they're written, uh, just recently uh, on TV, Netflix, they did the uh, update of The Boys in the Band. And The Boys in the Band was a 1970s Mark Crowley play that they did first on Broadway, and then they did a 1970s movie. And it was cringeworthy in the way the men were treating each other you understood why it was that. And now they redid the film. And my question is, I understand this as an older gay person, but through a younger gay person, do they realize the way the people were being mean to each other? They were almost sharpening their battle swords. So when they had to go out in the real world and address the homophobia and the colorism coming out of that, they'd already sparred with each other. If you're not putting in context, I'm not sure if people would understand that. Mm -hmm. uh, the same way when you're doing historical plays, why are you doing it for a 2020 audience? And for me, that's my job as a director. If we're doing the show right now, I better have a really good reason for doing that. Otherwise, you might be doing more harm than good. And that just doesn't mean talkbacks. That means if you see the play without a talkback, already you're seeing it. Um, 
couple of years ago, I did the Heidi Chronicles by Wendy Wasserstein. And it was written in the 80s, but it was about the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And first wave, second wave feminism and how Heidi Holland navigates herself through this as a woman in society and her friends. And I said, if I'm doing this play, it has to be color consciously cast in that in 1967, there would be all women of color in this as opposed to the regular, the original Broadway production didn't do that. Now you could have an art curator who would be a woman of color. So make sure that's on stage, make sure that we're seeing it reflected this way. And it was interesting to see young women that came and saw the play with Joy, and especially women in their 40s, 60s. Oh my God, that was me on stage. That I, I got to have my daughter come and see this because this is everything that I went through. Yeah. Thank you. Another question that's in the chat. Could you speak to connecting with members of other groups that are stereotyped and discriminated against as a way to join forces, but also to inform each other? Yes. And that's, I think theater is the one place that we do that with the DC theater summit that I'm working on right now. It's all. And once again, some people use this term sometimes don't, but BIPOC, black indigenous people of color, uh, that it's a rainbow coalition of everyone is doing that. And the great thing about doing it that way, all of a sudden a gay person says, yes, but you really haven't addressed my problem with this right now. And then the person, oh my gosh, yes. And our problems are not the same. The way that people address us are not the same. So having a wide net and also some of your allies in that group really make sure that we all join forces and can be stronger. Because we, when we fracture, we really can't do as much. So everybody has their own tribes then you bring together for the council and that's stronger to go forward. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have time for another question. Okay. Um, as you already know, Hamilton, the play Hamilton have, has uh, been uh, problematic recently. Someone asked, can you share your observations about Hamilton and its issues? Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no. You know what, I but I would, I would direct you to Toni Morrison and read what Toni Morrison wrote about Hamilton. And I agree with Toni Morrison. Okay. Yeah. Um, and be I, I do have, a there is another question here, but I wanna say a couple of the people also chatted if the articles you've referenced and the authors you've referenced, if we can share back. So maybe if you don't mind emailing yes. those to Ashley and then we can share them with everybody who registered for today. Beautiful. So Ashley, send comment. me your, an email then, cause I go to class right after this and I'll forget. So okay. <laughs> I'll send All right. we'll email you. <laughs> Yeah, and what I can do is I can also uh, Xerox some of the handouts and just uh, give that to you also. So here's a, um, last one. Um, I want to ask, and maybe this isn't important at the moment, but is RBF a phenomenon specific to people of color or to anyone fighting the spite? As a white person, I'm aware that I don't have the ongoing experience of otherness because of my color. However, I have been putting my voices into these battles to defend and uplift voices and have been met with such disheartening ignorance and bigotry, as I'm sure we all have. What more can I be doing as a white ally to my friends of color? Oh my gosh, I mean, that's such a wonderful question and so caring and sensitive. And yes, of course, uh, we all experience this differently, but we all go through the pain and suffering. And I think there's a couple of books that are out there right now, especially uh, Waking Up White by Debbie Irving. And I know we all know the D'Angelo books, but I think to address uh, that question, waking up white would really be a good primer for that. Bonnie, do you want to close this out at this point? Well, yeah, reluctantly, because there's a lot more to talk about. And, no. um, uh, you know, and I think one of the things um, that this conversation reminds me of is that in your field, in theater and performance, there's a way in which people have to bring their whole self, their cognitive self, their embodied self, their emotional self, 
in order to really be any good. And so that's, a, that's, that's very challenging. And I just wonder how many of us who are in other spaces that are really focused on your cognitive self um, and, and, and really maybe disconnected in some ways from your um, psychological or embodied self, at least in terms of the conveying of ideas and information. And we've spent so much time and energy on um, cognitive arguments about racism and all of these kinds of things. I just think that theater has a lot to offer us and thinking about, I would love to think more about the ways in which <clears throat> it can help uh, those of us in other fields uh, address these issues. I think you've raised um, uh, a lot for us to think about and I really, uh, really appreciate this uh, time. Do we, uh, do I have to stop or can Scott respond? Scott can respond. Okay, we do, okay, good. Yeah, and, and everyone, uh, first of all, just thank you for spending an hour with us today. I just feel so honored. Uh, I, and once again, I'm not a lecturer. I very interactive classes, so that was way too much about me today. Uh, but this is such, and, and I teach at 10 o'clock, so other than that, I would stay with you guys longer. Theater does have the possibility to change. And that's the reason why I went into theater. And that's especially the reason that I went into teaching after being a professional for 15 years. Because uh, fortunately, it was my dad, you know, that said, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And when I came here to teach that that was what I wanted to do was to make change. And I couldn't be prouder of the department that I'm in, the school that I'm in, the shows that we do, the dance that we do, and my colleagues in the music department coming over here to the Clarice. Back when we're open again, if you wanna see diversity in action, you come here at nine o'clock at night and you will hear groups singing in the hall. You will hear hip hop in the uh, stairwells. You will see people doing uh, monologues and scenes outside all the rooms. And I would say it's, you as a person of color, you never feel less than when you're at the Clarice and those nights. And I mean, during the day too, but it's very interesting at night when you walk through of how comfortable the students feel in this building and why I miss this and can't wait to bring it back, yeah. Well, I think that's it. We look forward to being able to come over there and walk through the building at night. Scott, I know you have to get to class and I know how much it means to you to be teaching and teaching in person in terms of uh, what you do. And so I really just thank you for taking this time before class to share with us. And we look forward to a, a, an enriched conversation because of your presentation. Thanks. So. Oh. Thank, well, you, thank you and thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you all. Take care. All right.